It's nice to have you joining us for today's C plus V webinar. My name is Ann Ayers and I have the honor of being the Dean of the Colorado Women's College and also the co-lead of this uh, fun initiative that we've had on campus. The purpose of which has really been to create a greater sense of belonging for everybody here at DU by talking about things that matter and are relevant to you. Um, and so thank you for, you know, sending us notes and letting us know what's on your mind uh, and how we can help um, and how we can kind of knit, knit this community together even more. I know that I'm feeling an incredible sense of pride about DU, uh, not only because um, of our ranking going up, which was really awesome. I hope you've all seen that news. Um, we went from 97th to 80th, which is really great, but also just this sense of like, we're doing it. We have people on campus. We've been planning for so long and it's real and it's happening. And so, uh, so that's exciting. So a bit about today, um, we are going to be doing some live closed captioning. We have put into the, uh, the chat window a link that you'll need to use for that. So there's a malfunction between the captioner who's here with us and doing the captioning and then the technology that, that usually feeds back through to Zoom. So if you can have the Zoom window open and then also this stream text window open at the same time, you'll be able to, um, to see the captioning. It looks like it's pretty good real time for us today. Also, when we post the recorded version of this, we will have uh, captioning in that. So if you would like to have that as a backup, that would be um, no problem at all. Uh, so I wanted to just share, you know, today is about um, parenting and figuring all of that. I think really, in my mind, it's about getting real. Uh, I, I have four boys myself, um, and I will never forget my, my first one follows all the rules because he's the first child. And the second one, the day I, he was like two and a half, and I said, you need to go sit on the stairs and have a time out. And my other child would sit there forever and ever and ever. And this one, like he sat on the stairs and he got up and he walked away. And I realized in that moment, I was like, I have no control over this situation at all. I really, it was my first parenting. Yep, this is, I don't have any control. And now I feel like I just don't have any control over the world. And I, I guess I never really had control over either, <laughs> but it feels like it's in um, high definition these days. So we wanted to be able to, as we're entering into back to school, chat with you about how to handle all of that. Because we know that many of us are, um, you know, we are working parents, we are parents, we are students and parents. Uh, and so how we, can we support those who, who we love the most? Um, so we have with us today four fabulous people who I just um, know and cherish. Um, Dil Khan, who is a graduate student in media, film, and journalism, and is a graduate fellow who's been working on Community Plus Values with us for a year and had a tremendous impact. Um, so she is going to facilitate this conversation. Uh, please be sure during the conversation to post your questions in the Q&A or in the chat, and she will be grabbing those through um, toward the end, but also a little bit throughout. Uh, we also have Jennifer Karras, who is here, who's joined us, was the very first person who ever took me to lunch when I got to DU, by the way. <laughs> so so I, really love, um, I really love thinking back about lunch. It was nice. We talked about all kinds of fun things. Um, she's our Vice Pro Provost for Academic Affairs. Um, Jennifer also has her PhD in sociology, and um, she will tell you about her three children and what they're up to. Um, Derrigan Silver is, uh, is with us today as well. Derrigan and Jennifer, it turns out, talk about this stuff a lot behind the scenes, so, so maybe we'll hear some of that chit-chat. Um, Derrigan works in the, uh, he's an associate professor in the Department of Media, Film, and, and Journalism, and an adjunct faculty member in the Sturm College of Law, as well as the faculty director of the Center for Innovation in the liberal and creative arts. Um, but what I know of Derrigan is he's one of the very best connectors across campus. So whenever there's something that's happening across units or across departments, you can be sure to find Derrigan right in the middle of it as the glue. Um, Steven Ginsburg is someone who has uh, certainly made me a better parent. Now, <laughs> oh, Steven and I have known each other for about five years. Um, I've had him on speed dial occasionally um, just to kind of get through some rough patches. But I really appreciate, um, Steven, that you are always very um, compassionate and pragmatic, like you give us real stuff to do. So I'm looking forward to this conversation with you today. Um, Stephen has his bachelor's in, uh, from Tufts in clinical psychology and then also a graduate degree from DU, of course, so it was one of our alums. So with that, I'm going to say uh, goodbye. I'll come back at the very, very, very end just to um, tell you about what we have planned in a few weeks, but um, I'm going to turn this over to Dill and our fabulous panelists with all kinds of gratitude and um, my listening ears on. Wonderful, thank you so much, Anne. Um, and I wanted to welcome again our panelists, 
and our guest speaker. And thank you, Anne, for um, introducing us all. Um, without further ado, I'm just going to kick it over to Dr. Silver and Dr. Karras uh, to go ahead and, and ask their questions to Dr. Ginsburg. So, Stephen, uh, we'll start. I think there's probably a lot of people, and I know Jennifer and I both have very personal experiences as um, faculty members and administrators and what's going on with, with quarantine and isolation. Um, and then we certainly want to move to that, but let's start with sort of a more general question. Um, you know, a lot of us are working parents now who are at home. We have kids who might be taking classes at home, either full-time or part-time. And this situation really leads to a lot of stress and a lot of pressure on all of us. And I think what happens with a lot of my friends that I'm talking to is they feel like they're doing an inadequate job as parents and they feel like they're doing an inadequate job at work. And this just makes them feel even worse and makes the situation even worse. So as a parent, how do we deal with those feelings of inadequacy both in our professional life and our personal life? And what are the healthy ways that we can deal with the stress that is brought on from us all being in very small, very tight locations with each other? You know, it's a, it's a great question. First of all, uh, thank you very much for having me. I'm a proud DU alum uh, and, and feel so grateful for the education that I had at DU. Um, you know, I think the first thing I would say is um, be kind and compassionate with yourself and the people around you. Um, you know, all, in all likelihood, you, you are doing a phenomenal job at, at both and are doing the best that you can. I think it's also really important to recognize that these are incredibly difficult, unpredictable, challenging times. And it is harder than normal. So I think the first thing would, do, would, would be to, to be kind to yourself and give yourself and your children and the people around you a bit of grace. I think the next thing to do is, is to be pragmatic about what you have control over and what you don't have control over. With my clients and folks I work with, I talk about controlling the controllables. It's really important to recognize that there is so much in this world right now that we don't have control over. And so I think it's really important to kind of narrow your, your focal point. Pay attention to the small things that you can control each day and help your kids to focus on each day. You know, one way to do that is to, to create goals. And, and realistic goals based on the world is different right now. Life is different right now. And so we do need to change what we think is possible. You probably could do more because you weren't, you know, going to check on your young child at the computer um, or, or to check in with your struggling college student. So um, I think that it's important to set small goals and, and work to achieve them. Um, but I think connection is huge. And I talk about connection a lot. I think there's connection within and connection between. So connect with what you're feeling, be aware of that, and then work towards resiliency. The last thing I say before I'll, I kick it back to you is recently I've been working with this analogy of running and tripping and falling over. If you've run and you've fallen and you're down on the ground, and you continue to move your legs and your arms, you're still not gonna go anywhere. So the first thing you have to do is reckon with the fact that you're on the ground, push up off of the ground and then be able to move forward. I think that's a really lovely analogy. I really, I like the frame that that gives me. Um, and I think that, that we're gonna come back to that throughout, throughout this conversation. Um, my, my, I have three daughters and they're in varying uh, ages, uh, but uh, all experiencing that transition through ad adolescence to adulthood. Um, and for right now, I, for my youngest, who's 14, thinking really about that, that unpredictability of her world and that balance between that the reality is scary, right? She is convinced that she has COVID right this second. She's no, there's no symptoms, right? There, but there's that risk that's in the world. So the world is scary and the world has to continue and you have to pick yourself up and you have to keep moving your arms and legs or for her, right? Uh, uh, she has to get back in the pool, right? So the Derrigan's yeah. kids and my kiddo are swimmers. That's how we, we know each other so well. Well, other reasons, but, but how, do I, how do I convince her that, yeah, you have to get in the pool. You have to, get, you have to keep moving when the world is really that, it is so scary, right? That this will be her second COVID test that she wants to go get, but she's, like, she's, she's so anxious, so anxious about getting sick. 
What, what do you recommend? You know, I, I just feel for her, uh, you know, because we're inundated, we're just flooded with information about how dangerous the world is right now. And some of that's very real. And I think you said a word in there that's really important, and that is both or and, you know, and that, that both and and, they're so important because you can feel both scared and continue to move forward and know that it's best. Swimming is, is great, right? Because, you know, it's so important to focus on your own lane. There's this great picture of Michael Phelps swimming against another swimmer in the Olympics and Phelps has got his head straight on and, and this other swimmer is looking over at him and of course Phelps out touches him. And I bring that up because it's important to get in your lane and focus on your lane and focus on what small things you can do to move forward each day. But it's hard, it's hard work. <laughs> It is every single day. Um, and the tricky part that I didn't share with you, uh, I didn't know at the time when we agreed to do this, is that my middle daughter, my 18 year old, is now home from uh, college. Uh, she's positive with COVID. So uh, there, there is that real sense that, yeah, COVID, COVID happened and it happens in her life. It's really close. And the first thing that she said was, you know, is, is she going to die? Right. And this is a healthy 18 year old. We're so blessed in so many ways. Um, and, and, lives, and she's fine. Uh, she has a sore throat and she's grumpy. But, um, but, but again, this reality that keeps getting around them, um, it, that, is, that this is real. And, but still to have to think about what do you have control over, right? To, but the, with a 14 year old, that's, that's a hard, hard place to, to stay. It's really hard. It, it's really, really hard. And uh, I, I just know that um, you know, there's a, a sports psychologist named Kevin Elko, and one of the phrases he uses with his teams is, so what, now what? The so what can, can be flippant, and I think it's, you know, it can be, hey, you know, so what, you feel that way. I don't think that's how it really should be interpreted. It, it's so what, I do feel that way. Now what am I going to do? Or so what, that did happen. Now what am I going to do? Yeah, good. So Stephen, let me ask you, um, so Jennifer and I both have experience with, with children who have been uh, placed in quarantine at their respective universities. Um, our kids barely overlap in age, and so we have a lot of these conversations, and we have been having these conversations about parenting for the last 10 years. Um, but I'm very close with my 18-year-old daughter. We've been close for years. And I was already struggling with her going to college and not knowing how much freedom to give her. We've raised all of our kids to be extremely independent, um, you couldn't, we, we, my wife and I don't remotely resemble helicopter parents at all, but I just miss my kid a lot, right? Like not checking in on her. I understand she's going to be having experiences that she doesn't want to share with her dad. She's going to be doing things that she's never done before. She was very quiet in high school. I don't she didn't think she's ever attended a high school party. So it's not those things that I'm so much worried about. It's, it's rather, how do you let your kids grow? but still let them know that you're there for them. Like I, I, I really struggle with how much should I contact her or should I just let her contact me? And then on top of that, um, she got placed in, in quarantine. She was on campus for a week and ended up being, being placed in a room uh, by herself. And all four of her classes were online, so she didn't fall behind academically. But I just worried tremendously about her mental health, her emotional growth. Um, I remember back to my first three weeks in college and that's where I made friends with people I'm still friends with today, that I still call on a regular basis. Um, as parents, how can we help college age kids navigate these difficult times, but especially when they're placed in either quarantine or isolation, what can we do to help them while also realizing that this is a journey and this is a hardship that they will grow from and they will become stronger individuals from? Boy, what a, what a good question. And, and first, I'll just say, what a tough situation she's in. She moves to, to college and, and, you know, you're right. This is where a lot of your friends were made and this is where it should be joyous. And it's, it's just not. And, and so I just feel for these college kids and they're just getting going on a whole new phase. And, and it's just so, so hard. Um, I guess what I would say to your question is, is, you know your child best and every child is different. And so there isn't a prescription for, you know, talk to your kid this many times or let them lead the process. You know, I'm a big fan of being open and authentic and honest and say, I, I don't know, I've never done this before. Um, so I don't know exactly how to support you right now, but I want you to know I'm here for you. 
and I want to support you through it. And I know it's hard, but I want to give you space and I don't know how to do that. So I need guidance and, and kind of treat her as the expert. From there, I mean, I think when it comes to quarantine, I think it's being able to understand how she's doing and what are her goals for the quarantine and what's she going through. I think an important thing to remember is, you know, we talk about uh, social distancing all the time. It's actually a terrible term, if you ask me. I think it's physical distancing that is necessary. It's not social distancing. It's really important that we're socially connected while physically distant. So you have to help her brainstorm, how can she remain socially connected while physically distant at this point in time? And then I'm big on goal setting, you know, and I'm big on writing those goals down and sharing them with folks. And so one thing you can do is, she, you know, she can write down those goals for each day and say, you know, why don't you call me at the end of tomorrow and let me know how it went. And if you need help brainstorming, I'll brainstorm with you. But, um, you know, acknowledging this is really hard it's also an opportunity. So what can you do that gives you a sense of control in this otherwise very out of control situation? So Stephen, let me just, let me follow that up. So um, as Jennifer mentioned, um, our children are swimmers. And so my daughter was really blessed that even though she was only on campus for a week, she had all these connections. She had, she had this social capital that she could call upon, right? She had juniors and seniors on the swim team who were zooming her or texting her or or checking in so she she we, we feel very lucky that she had this sort of support system but if other students maybe have only been on campus for a week and they're not part of an athletic team and they don't have a coach who's checking on them maybe they're at a really big university at the university of denver we're pretty small and so we can check on these people i was i drove my car over to a quarantine house last night to deliver um, uh, lunchables and Snickers bars and just some other stuff. But but some students maybe at really large universities, if they haven't had that chance to build those social connections, what can we do to help them build those social connections? You know, Boy, I mean, to, you know, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say to further that point, I've been on the phone with DU parents, and so in my in my day job, right, that they're calling with these same kinds of questions. My student is calling home; they're feeling really disconnected. Their first experience at DU was to be placed right into quarantine. Um, I don't, I don't know what to do from afar, right? So it's this, these these complications. It's 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 a really tough time to be a student and a parent right now. Oh my goodness! I mean, it's hard enough to send your your 18 year old off to college, and and then, you know, as as you both were saying, you know, just hope for the best, and then to have this come up, it's just excruciating. Whether it's a DU or larger universities, I would encourage, you know, opportunities for connection in whatever safe ways that you can. And so, you know, if, if there are ways to like, you know, I, I'm talking to my college students all the time and saying, connect with your RA, you know, have them set up a dorm, you know, a floor Zoom or something that allows you to feel connected, meet and greets in some way open your window and shout out and, you know, see if the kids who are not quarantined can come by and social, you know, or physically distance and, and be there for you or, but also you brought up a really important word and that is team. It's really important for all of us, whether we're athletic or not to have a team, you know, who you, you I have a rule that you can't suffer in silence. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to, to rely on your team and to, to talk with them and be able to say, who's a part of my team, who's earned the right for me to vulnerably share how I'm doing, because we need to struggle together. And there's strength in that. It's not weakness. I think so talking um, about that. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Darian. No, no, go ahead, Jennifer. No, I was going to say that some of the, the questions in the chat and, uh, you know, I, I'm kind of really thinking about that this loneliness that we're seeing in in middle school and in college kids, too. But I, I want to focus on the, the ones in, in, in middle school and elementary school. Uh, I think that COVID and distance learning has made all the regular kinds of life transitions even more um, anxiety provoking for them. I'm seeing a lot of increase in social anxiety. In, um, in my kids, but I, but I also know of my friends who have smaller kids. What are the kinds of things that you recommend for uh, parents who are seeing their kids feel because of remote learning distance and, um, and, um, and detached and, and, and that loneliness? Yeah, 
In addition to being a psychologist who happens to see a lot of kids and families, I'm also a dad myself. I've got a six-year-old and a four-year-old, uh, both boys. And, and so I know this one from the inside out. Um, you know, it, it, the, the pressures, the challenges, they're real. Um, you see it every day. Um, they're affected um, just like we're affected. Um, our job is to be compassionate with them. Our job is to connect with them. Our job is to create opportunities where they can safely see their friends. You know, even if it's, you know, sitting in a wide circle in a park. Our job is to connect with them in the best ways that we can, knowing that we only have half a tank too. But I think it's hard. I think that they are, I would call it, the word I've been using is socially deconditioned. Um, I will tell you, both as a father and as a psychologist, I really, really believe in resiliency um, and, and plasticity, and kids are incredibly resilient. It's sort of the best part of my job is I just get to see how resilient people are every day. So I believe in their bounce back is the other thing I would say. If the panelists don't mind, I wanted to pose a question um, to Dr. Ginsburg from um, a, a participant. Um, the the Q and A will be held at the end, um, the last fifteen or twenty minutes of the webinar. But uh, it just seemed pretty relevant, so I wanted to ask it now. Um, Stacy asked, uh, "My son is feeling isolated, lonely, and bored. Is anything being done to promote human contact within safety protocols?" Yes, I guess is the shorthand answer to that. I mean, I think schools are doing everything they can to get back, uh, you know, safely. Uh, it's it's an incredible dilemma that these schools are in. Um, soccer programs are are starting back up. Um, there there are some really creative people out there doing athletic uh, work where kids can be socially distanced, especially with little ones. They can be doing drills and different things to 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 safely be out there. So I think that's definitely there. I think it's seeing it as an opportunity. You know, what is this an opportunity for? What's a skill that we can be learning? What, what can we be doing to, to help you uh, grow even in this challenge, through this challenge? I wish there was more, I guess is the other answer. You know, I just wish there was more. It's just so hard to safely do that. Um, you know, I think that, you know, if you are fortunate enough to live in a neighborhood where there are other kids, it's being able to get your kids outside and, and have them wear masks and be safe and, and do all the things the medical professionals are telling us to do, but um, it, it's hard. No, I think that, as you say, the sport piece is a, is, a, is a big piece of this. I mean, I really noticed that, again, once, uh, once those activities were able to start up again, there was a, there was a marked difference. So even though it's, it's, there's physical distance, there is some social connection that's still going on. And, and also that return to a schedule, there was a lot of comfort with that, of just knowing that my that regular piece of my life is still there for my child, my kid at least. Yeah, twins, absolutely. I, yeah, go ahead. I have 13 year old, I have 13 year old twins and um, the day we told them they could go back to swim practice was th their best day in six months. The fact that they, and we were really worried because we were like, look, and my kids swim at DU. And the protocols here for going to swim practice are ridiculous. Like you, you think our protocols for moving back onto campus were tough? You should have seen what my kids had to do just to go to swim practice. Yeah. And I was really worried about them. And I was like, well, you're going to be wearing a mask and you're going to have an assigned seat and it's going to be one kid per lane. Um, you know, it's not going to be normal. And I was really worried about that, them freaking out about the non-normalness of it. And they could care less. That to them, it was just they didn't care that their friends had masks on. It put some schedule back in their day. Um, you know, and you were talking about, you know, the, making connections and, and getting out in the neighborhood. And one of the things my wife always points out is she sees lots of girls in our neighborhood who are kind of like, like clustering together. And it's the girls who want to be together in the real world. Um, but the boys, my boys, like, they're like we're, we're talking to our friends. We're just talking to them over Call of Duty. Yeah. Right. And yeah. so we used to have these really strict rules about you can only be on screen times for X number of, of hours. And my wife and I were joking where our new rule is you can only be on screen times for 23 hours a day. Like that's it. Yeah. We draw the line at 23 hours. Um, I mean, what are those what are those safe ways that college students and, and I mean, is it OK that our boys 
are bonding by talking. I mean, they talk to each other, not very nicely, but they talk to each other over their headsets while they play Call of Duty. So I yeah. can hear them talking to their friends. Um, so what, yeah. what, like, what, is that okay? Oh, and somebody in the panel is also, your husband's talking with his friends over Call of Duty. See, yeah, it's, not just, it's not just my boys. It's, yeah. That's, is that yeah. an acceptable way for people to spend time together? Yeah, I mean, acceptable, absolutely. It's better to be able to be seeing people directly, of course, but, you know, limitations are limitations. And so I think that being creative and crafty about how you, you find that social interaction is, is key. Boy, I, I think about what it's like to be a kid. I think about, you know, leaving school one day and then not seeing your friends for six months. That's awful. It's just awful. It's so hard. And so when we say, you know, what, what do you think about this? Going back with masks, they're like, I don't care. You know, give me any opportunity and I will take it. Um, I think it's okay to, to, for them to do that. I think it's great for them to schedule video game hangouts. I think it's great for them to, uh, you know, find FaceTime uh, opportunities. And uh, I've had kids watch Netflix together, or order the same takeout, you know, college students are ordering the same place, you know, from takeout and just sharing the experience without actually sharing the experience. It's a great question. So, Stephen, we've been focusing a lot on, um, on college kids and quarantine and isolation. And I think that partly because I think a lot of people in the audience are DU parents who saw this as an opportunity to hear about like, about what DU is doing. But yeah. I have a lot of colleagues at DU, my wife and I, when we're sort of walking around and feeling bad for ourselves, we'll turn to each other and say, at least we don't have little kids, right? Like that's yeah. the way we make ourselves feel better. Yeah. Um, but for people, you know, for DU faculty or, or people in the audience who, who have small children where they, they can't put their kid on call of duty, <laughs> you know, and, and they can't just say, okay, you're on Zoom for eight hours for class a day. Like, if you have a six-year-old, you got to be interacting them with them on the class. Like, for them, I just think this is, this is it's so hard for the at-home part, but they also may really feel like, okay, I'm, I'm done at work, right? Like, I'm, I'm basically taking a two-year leave of absence from work, and I, I might not be able to pick back up on that. And I'm, I'm particularly concerned about my my female colleagues who have small children because we, we all know as much as we try to be egalitarian in my house at least much of the burden of child raising falls on my wife even when she was working she's not currently working but even when she was it did like what what advice do you have both for people with small children who are feeling extra stressed by this but also um women who might feel like they are now double tasked in a way that's even worse than they were double tasked before. Um, and they may have to give something up, like something has to give. How do, how do you deal with that? First off, I think you're totally right. Something has to give. I mean, this is to your first question. It's like, it is harder. There is less, you know, in the pot of resources. I think it's hard to be a parent of any of any child right now. I do think it's extra hard to be a parent of young children um, because so much is required of you, you know, for a 13 year old or a 17 year old, you know, it's like they're in their room and they know how to work Zoom. And, but I think of these kindergartners who don't know how to read and their teachers are, are, are saying, okay, now click on that button. They're like, what button? I, I don't even know how to read you know, yet. And, and so, um, so much is required of parents and, and I feel for them. Um, I also realize that, that, you know, in single parent homes, this is incredibly difficult. It, it is asking so, so very much of these parents. I think our job is to band together and figure out how we can, uh, you know, help each other you know, and that is where if you feel comfortable having, you know, a couple kids at your house one day and a couple kids at the, the next person's house the next day, you know, trading off, having a plan is really important. So as hard as it is in the moment to, to wing it and say, okay, why don't you try this or do that? Or here's what you should do instead of call of duty for the next couple hours. Um, I think having a plan or, or, or sort of like a, uh, a list, a menu, of things that you can do ahead of time is helpful because then you're not having to, to sort of do it by surprise. Um, it, it's, 
I just, you know, we are fortunate enough to live in a neighborhood where there are a lot of, uh, of little kids. And, and I saw for both my boys, their world sort of turn around when we allowed them with masks and everything to, to go play, um, you know, because that's where they learn. I mean, we can't forget that socialization and play is where kids learn how to share, um, how to take turns, um, how to be creative, um, how to regulate emotion. I mean, that's the biggest thing I'm seeing for these young kiddos. They have underdeveloped brains to begin with. And so they're feeling what we're feeling, but they don't have as much of a prefrontal cortex to be able to manage that. And it's just asking a lot of them. You know, I think that that, that applies with the older kids too. I mean, that underdeveloped uh, brain, uh, but they really do need the, the social interaction. I think over the summer, we, um, we allowed our, our daughters really just to have like one good friend that they were going out with or going out with going out to the backyard with but um but knowing that they needed they, they desperately needed that connection i think that again this transition to adulthood they're especially vulnerable in terms of that just that that craving for um that back and forth and so having having you know i guess the safe friends was 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 really what helped us get through the summer yeah I mean, we're pack animals. We can't forget that, that, that we really are, um, you know, here to be in connection with one another. And that is um, how we, you know, feel soothed. That is how, how we survive. I mean, it really is a connection need. And I think about uh, the, the intense social needs of the adolescent in particular, and, and that um, that's where they're forming their sense of identity, their, their sense of self. Um, and so when we say, sorry, you can start college, but you can't have that, um, you know, what is going on with their oxytocin? You know, what, it, what is going on uh, with their dopamine levels? And that, that's where I get really concerned. Yeah. Stephen, let me, so this question, this is not one that I, I posed to you beforehand. So this is going to come out of the left field, so I apologize for that. But I was, I was teaching my in-person class the other day, and I'm teaching a, like a 40-person class. In a, in a room that holds 490 students, right? So it's already just like super bizarre and not, not normal. But at one point during the class, like I just noticed my students were all kind of like awkward. Like they didn't, they didn't really know what to do. And so I just stopped class and I was like, does everybody else feel really strange? Does everybody else feel really weird right now? Because I feel super weird. This is just bizarre. And 100% of them, their hands just shot up and they're like, yeah, this is crazy. Like we're back in class. Is there like, is there a, like a readjustment danger? Is there a, like, like that, that coming, it's almost like coming out of an airlock, right? Like, like you've been in yeah. this airlock and the door's opening up. Is there a danger of, of psychological trauma and mental health issues just from opening it back up? Yes. I mean, I, well, not, not so much from opening it back up, but I think there's, uh, the term that has been thrown around recently is social atrophy. And, um, and, and so I think you got to think of it as a muscle like anything else, and, and it hasn't been exercised. And so it feels strange. And so I think basically my advice would be to, to just assume that there's going to be this period of sort of readjustment or adjustment back in. Um, there's a reason why we're seeing, you know, anxiety and depression levels at, at an unbelievable high. Um, and, and so much of that, uh, I can, uh, you know, uh, point to the, the lack of, of social connection, that lack of, of connectedness. Um, but what I would say is, is what you're doing or what you did is just perfect. Um, identify it, talk about it, normalize it, and, and then move through it. I hope folks don't mind. Um, Dr. Silver brought something up that I sort of wanted to pivot back to. Um, it was a question of my own. So I'm not a parent, but uh, I have two nieces. One's five, one's two. The five-year-old is in first grade um, and she's doing it uh, online, which is really odd because um, you think of, you know, young children doing online school and it's exactly how, um, you know, someone earlier had described it. It's like, you don't know where the buttons are and you don't know how to interact with anyone on Zoom. And it's like, it's, I mean, the teacher is doing story time and there is, it's only like 45 minutes of class and suddenly parents find themselves homeschooling their children. Um, so I, I just wanted to know, do you have any tips for parents who are overwhelmed and find themselves playing 
the role of a teacher, a therapist at some point, um, a parent also juggling work, um, but also in addition to that, teaching their children um, and having tough conversations with them about everything that's going on in the world, not just with COVID, I mean, with the racial pandemic, with um, all of sort of the, the fires on the West Coast, that's really intense. I mean, the news isn't, it's not, it's not the greatest it's been. So, you know, just do you have any tips for parents who are suddenly find them, finding themselves playing 10 different roles at the same time? Yeah. You know, a, a psychologist many years ago came up with the phrase, good enough mother. And, and I think we can expand it to good enough parent um, and, and frankly, good enough person. Um, being good enough is just that it's good enough and that we have to recognize we can't hold ourselves to this standard of perfection. So, you know, stay off of Instagram if it looks like everybody on your feed is telling you what a great mother or father they are um, and, and how great their, their children are doing all the time. It's just like, frankly not true. Um, and, and the other thing I would say to you is, is to realize that it's okay. It's okay if you log off you know, one day. It's okay if you weren't your best at work. It's okay if you don't know what you're doing and you say, I don't know what I'm doing. It's okay if you have a hard day. Um, the other thing, just because you brought it up, is, is to kind of recognize energy drainers and energy gainers. Um, and so if the news is a big energy drainer, you know, really limit you know, how, how often you're, you're watching the news. I, I'm, you know, a big proponent of remaining informed and, um, and sort of remaining knowledgeable. But if it's not helping you and it's harming you, it's important to do something about that and limiting it is a great way. So we've been talking a lot, the faculty right now at DU are under tremendous pressure, right, to deliver a really good product that our parents and our students and our community are used to in totally new ways, right? Like learn, learn how to use this camera, be in this high flex situation. Oh, by the way, you have to be in the chat of Zoom. And that stress boils over, right? And, and the way that universities work is frequently faculty take that stress out on staff and administrators. And they, we, we explode, I explode at Jennifer, right? Like, I'm like, damn it, Jennifer, I can't do this. You're asking too much of me. Never, I never. never, I never, I never say that to Jennifer. But um, we were talking, we have, a, um, we have an associate provost of uh, faculty affairs here, and I was having a conversation with her, and she was talking about the need for faculty to be, um, to be um, flexible and compassionate. And we were saying, look, every decision you make, it, when you're dealing with a, with a staff member or when you're dealing with an administrator or when you're dealing with a student, say, am I being flexible? Am I being compassionate? And if the answer to those two questions are yes, then you're probably doing the right thing, right? Because we have no game book for this. We have no rules for this. We're, making, we're, we're building the airplane as we are taking off. And those are the two real guiding principles. And then I was talking to a faculty member, and I gave that advice to a faculty member about working with her students. And she was texting me kind of late at night, and she's like, I'm just, it's too much. Like, I, I, like I, I'm being asked to be everything to everybody. And I texted her back and I said, remember that advice about, are you being flexible and are you being compassionate? Okay, that's not just for staff, that's not just for administrators, that's not just for students, that's for you too. Like, are you treating yourself with flexibility and compassion? And if you are, then you're probably doing the right thing. Derek, and that's beautiful. I, I, I'm glad you brought that up because it's, it's something I uh, hope to bring up today and that is, you know, monitor our self-talk scripts. How, how are we talking to ourselves? And would we talk to a loved one? Or would we, you know, put up with someone else talking to us like that? <laughs> and, and oftentimes no. the answer is, is, a, is a big fat no. So I think that it really is important to be able to monitor the compassion and flexibility we give to others, but also to ourselves. Um, the other thing is, is creating spaces where we can um, vet creating a safe space for people to own their, their difficulty. Um, and it might lead to less displacement is the term for it, right? I'm mad at this situation that I can't control. So I'm gonna take it out on this staff or faculty member. 
I think it's also important, you know, being on the receiving end, I think of some of the less than generous comments from my colleagues other than Derrigan, um, is just to, is to think about where it's coming from, right? It is coming from a lot of sense of anxiety and fear, right? And that it's, it, it, maybe it's me, maybe I'm a jerk, that, that, that's certainly always the case, but it's it, to really think about the context where things are coming from and to try to let that slide and for me to find compassion, right? So it's always that find compassion, you know, that's, that's the back message that I'm, that I'm trying to, to keep uh, the, that, that message going, but it's hard. It really is. I mean, you feel depleted at the end of a, you know, a 13 hour day of, of that and then coming home and finding compassion with, with my, uh, with my family here too. It, you know, it's, it's we're, so, that, right? That's we're in it. That's right. We're in it together. And I think that, uh, one of the, the foundational elements of compassion or empathy is perspective taking and, and being able to take the perspective of another is, is crucial. You know, Brene Brown has this great story in one of her books uh, about um, whether or not she believes uh, that people are doing the best that they can. And she asks all these people and she says, I'm biased, but I believe my husband, who's a pediatrician, had the best answer. And she asks him, what does he think? And he said, you know, Brene, I don't know, but I believe that people are trying the best that they can, give them what they know, because it makes my life better and it makes their life better. So I'll, I'll, so you were talking about safe spaces and, and, and outlets. So I'll, I'll out myself on some, some really unhealthy behavior I have. I have several colleagues who I consider safe spaces. Jennifer, to, to, in the interest of full disclosure, Jennifer is one of my safe spaces. Uh, and I think I'm one of Jennifer's safe spaces. Um, I mean, is it, like, is it healthy just to be able to blow off steam to somebody every once in a while? Because you know, I like my wife is very understanding and very compassionate, but sometimes the nuances of what I'm frustrated about, she can listen, but she can't really identify. I mean, is it is it okay to have colleagues that you consider to be safe spaces that you just need to sort of lose it with and who you're close enough with that they give you permission to lose it without ever judging you? And like Jennifer, and I do you not. Answer, you cannot answer that. No, it's not okay because that's the only thing that's keeping me hanging on right now. It's just being able to have those trusted companions that I can that that know that I you know that at my heart I I I'm not evil or vile or all of those kinds of things. But I need that release. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say it's not okay. In <laughs> fact, I would say the opposite. It's more than okay. Um, it's necessary. It's a lifeblood for you. And, and, and the reason why um, is because if we don't, then we end up suppressing it. And what we know, uh, you know about suppression is that suppression doesn't work. In fact, it intensifies the emotion. And it comes out in other ways. So, you know, you know we, we are like this cup of water here. Like we do fill up. And, and if we keep adding in, we'll spill over too. So, so we have to acknowledge that our, our, our water level is rising. I wanted to go ahead and pivot to the Q&A, um, questions that were posed by our participants. Um, I wanted to first start with um, a question that I believe Dr. Silver posed um, in an email, uh, but I'll go ahead and ask it. Um, there's a lot of pressure that comes from knowing that every single thing that we do in this new environment is going to be judged. Um, and this is in terms of faculty members, because um, a lot of faculty members are uh, under a lot of pressure. Um, a lot of faculty members are playing, uh, like parents, they're playing the role of a therapist, they're playing the role of the advisor, they're playing, you know, they're, you know, their professor, suddenly they're having to adjust. Um, and a lot of people are relying on them. Um, and so uh, students are experts, obviously, at teaching and learning, but yet their evaluations are given such high consideration in terms of faculty performance evaluations. Um, we're between a rock and a hard place. I am reading word for word his question. <laughs> uh, being required to uh, adapt on the fly, but also getting evaluated in ways that haven't adapted. Um, so how do we address that? Oof. Uh... That's a really good question. You know, I have the advantage here of not only being a DU uh, alum, but also being uh, a previous teacher in the Graduate School of Professional Psychology, a position that I was really, really lucky to have for a number of years. And, um, and so I, I know what it's like to get those evaluations and read those evaluations. And, um, and so the first thing is to any teachers or, you know, excuse me, professors out there listening, 
um, I feel for you because um, it's, it's a hard process uh, to get that kind of feedback. I think our job is to look at any feedback, no matter how harsh, as a potential learning opportunity. But to separate ourselves from the feedback that we're getting, um, we are not our performance. That is a really important thing. Um, our identity as a human being is not tied to how well or how poorly other people think we're doing. That said, um, I, I think that I would continue to be open to feedback from our students wherever we can, realizing that there are boundaries and limitations as well. So I really believe that it's important to say, hey guys, you know, give me ongoing feedback. That was one thing I learned after my first year of being a professor is to say, please don't wait till the end when you get to anonymously, you know, write your, your thoughts down about me. Tell me to me, that way I can really work on this while I'm here with you. Um, and so creating an environment in which you feel like they can honestly and openly and vulnerably share what they think is going well, because frankly, they have some good ideas. And some of them we can integrate and some of them we cannot. But uh, if we know that, you know, in the first third of, of the trimester, quarter, or semester, then, then we have a chance of creating a better class. And Dill, I can't, I can't recall if you said that this was a DU faculty member or not, but I know at the Office of Teaching and Learning, we at, at DU, we have um, a session when, our, when we get our evaluations back, which is how to find constructive feedback in your evaluation. So folks come with their evaluations together and it's, it is a support group, right? And, and the best advice I've ever gotten about this is for my husband, which is just do not let the butt heads get you down. There will always be, you know, that person that's gonna make a nasty comment about an outfit you, that you wore and you get, to, you get to take that one away. Again, you are not, that, that, you are not who that is. But, but again, as you said, Stephen, to, take what you, to learn what you can from this. And so there is like a support group to, to read your evaluations with. They're, they're devastating sometimes. Yeah. If there are faculty in the audience, one of the things that I found is that the newness of the teaching environment has been a little bit freeing to me because I can, I can get there and be like, I have no clue what I'm doing, right? Like, I let my, I let my, like, the first day I taught, I had the camera do one thing, and I have some students in class and some students at home are on the camera. And then the, set, the next day, I did something different with the camera. And I was just like, which is better, A or B? Like, I don't really care. I'll do whatever works for you. And they're all like, oh, B was way better than A. I'm like, great, then we'll do B. But having that, like, asking them for feedback on the very first day and the, and the second day of class, for me, was a little bit freeing to be able to say, like, look, I don't know what I'm, this is all new to me too, right? Or we had a professor in political science who, uh, tweeted out. She she gave herself a really nice pat on the back because she figured out how to do breakout um, breakout rooms in a hybrid class. And she's like, it it worked. And I think celebrating those small victories. Like like so far we've been we've been talking about how to deal with um, you know sort of ad adversity and defeat. But I think we also have to give ourselves that permission to celebrate those small victories, right? Like after my first in person class on Monday my adrenaline was just like pumping through my system. I was like, yeah, like this is, this is going to be cool. This is going to be interesting. And, and so giving yourself permission to celebrate all, small victories, I think is really important too. You know, one other thing I'll just add to this is, is one thing I talk about with a number of families I get to see is, is the importance in terms of communication of coming kind of like palms up moments rather than dukes up moments. You know, if you're dukes up, you're going to get other people putting their fists up and wanting to fight as well. But if you say, like Derek and you just said, I don't really know what's best and I need some help here, um, you know, I think you're going to get something back that feels different. And that's a huge leap, I think, for folks. And, 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 and we can flip this back to even thinking about parents, too, uh, to say, I don't, I'm, this is new to me, too, right? There are, I'm, I, I, haven't, I haven't been a parent of a college student before, so I don't know what you need. And that is terrifying, right? To, to say, for the person who is looked at, be at the person in control to say, no, this one's new. Uh, we're going through it together. That's a, that's a hard, it's a hard thing to do. I'll never forget many years ago, I had a parent walk in and the parent said to me, you know, Stephen, I need help. I'm a rookie. And what was funny about this was this was a parent of many, many children. And this wasn't uh, their, their first uh, that they were talking to me about. And that's the truth. You know, we are perpetually rookies um, with our kids and, and right now, especially with our with our classes, 
And so we're learning. We got to treat ourselves as rookies and we hope that other people can have the compassion and empathy to do the same. Um, I want to go ahead and there's a couple more questions. I want to make sure um, I ask them. Uh, Brian asks, what can we pre-plan for if another prolonged quarantine or shutdown happens this winter? What are the most important lessons we gained from last March? I mean, I think the first thing is the context of that question is really wonderful is that we've gained, you know, we're better off because of our struggle. If you think about adversity in general, I think what we realize is the best moments in life come following adversity. It's because of the fall down, not in spite of the fall down. And so we are better than we were then. Um, I think the, the lessons are going back to that physical distancing, uh, social distancing piece. I think uh, we also have the infrastructure now to be able to do more than we did before. I think we're realizing, um, you know, that we don't have the naivety that we did then, which is great for a couple of weeks, but it wears off for sure to say, maybe this will be over pretty soon. And so if it looks like it's gonna be another long haul, how, how do we settle in and, and find um, our team? How do we find our, our call of duty buddies or our um, you know, neighborhood kids that can come and sit on the porch? Um, I, I think it's vital that kids get outside. I'm a huge proponent of movement. Um, I, I think you know, so much of what I talk about emotionally um, falls well short if somebody is not moving. Uh, so, so I really believe that kids need to get out and, and move outside, even if they're having a, a snowball fight. We know more about, uh, we still don't know a lot, but we know more about the virus than we did back then too. So, um, so it allows us to operate differently when we're outside. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, Aaron asks, are there any mental health scholar resources on long-term social isolation or pandemic response and how people cope effectively? Boy, um, good question. I, I wish I had a better answer other than I don't know. Um, I know that there are a lot of books out there about coping and about how to um, set your environment up for success and um, to sort of know what your recipe is. And I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, but I don't honestly know uh, about pandemic uh, response. I'm sure there are people way more schooled in that than I. Um, and so we can look into that and see if we can get some resources uh, for those folks wanting to know that. The other thing that I would say, and this is a really important one that I didn't get to yet is, I think this is a tremendous time to understand your owner's manual or your, your personal recipe for success. Um, you can look at it in either way, but uh, I've been talking to folks a lot throughout the last six months about really taking the time to understand what goes in your recipe for success. How many hours of sleep do you need? What does your hydration look like? You know, what kind of foods are we putting in our body? How much do I need to move? How much social contact do I need? You know, what gives me energy? Um, and so I do think that kind of going through that system, or, or excuse me, systematically is really important for folks right now. What's in your recipe for success? And the last thing I'll say uh, is not about a book or a resource, but it's, um, I think so often we foc focus on what we want to be doing, not what we can be doing. And I think that that's a really important distinction because when we're focusing on what we uh, want to be doing when we can't be doing that, it leads to all kinds of stress, anxiety, uh, depression. Instead, what we wanna be doing is, you know, what's the best that I can be doing right now and see if we can work within that framework. Hey, Bill, I think Cindy dropped a really important yes. question. I don't wanna step on your toes as the moderator. No, no. Still, still a former student, so I, I know her very well as well, but. I think Cindy asked a really great question, especially, and I don't want this to go to a dark place, but um, for anybody who has teenagers these days, <clears throat> we've all we've all had fears of self-harm and we all have student, we have children who have friends who have self-harm to one extent or another. And so Cindy's question I think is really, really important. And my daughter's calling me right now, so I'm super excited. <laughs> um, Cindy says, I teach enrichment grades one through eight and virtually as well as in person. I'm also a parent of a college student who chose to stay home when all of her classes are online. Are there signs I should look for, red flags that may be different for those who are really struggling? 
And I think that's great. Yeah. And as you answer that, I'm going to text my daughter back that I'm going to call her right back as soon as this is over because I'm so happy she called me. <laughs> that's great. Um, I think the first is just to validate that that's a very real and understandable fear. Um, I think, you know, we want nothing more than uh, the safety for our children and the happiness for our children as parents. Um, but of course, you know, we can only control so much. I think that it really is important to proactively be checking in with our kids and be able to talk to them about how they're feeling. The reason I start there is because if we proactively are doing that, then we have a better understanding of sort of where they sit, at least as far as we can know, emotionally day in, day out. And they know that they can come to us. They know they can talk to us. So that's a really important proactive measure. I think it's really important, you know, the hallmarks are uh, to, to keep an eye on personal hygiene, um, dramatic changes in, in emotional presentation, um, eating and sleeping habits. Um, you know, there's some information out there about um, if somebody is really close to, you know, committing suicide, they may not look uh, like you would expect them to. And so there isn't always, uh, you know, a despondent approach or anything like that. Sometimes there's an overjoyed, like giddy, that's, you know, approach that seems really out of the norm. Um, and a giving away of things. That said, I, I, I certainly don't want anybody to, you know, be alarmed if their kid comes home and they're saying, yeah, I gave my hat to my friend. Uh, you know, I, I want you to be able to talk to them about your worry and your concern. I want you to be open with them and allow them to share their experience freely uh, and, and be a, a validating person. Seek to understand before being understood. So connect in a way that uh, allows them to feel safe and heard. Um, that connection is a huge, huge positive force in helping people stay alive. Um, I hope we have time for one more question. It looks like Anne's on, so I don't think we do. No, I think you do. I think, yeah? I think okay. yeah, go really quick. Okay. Um, this is for all of you. So um, each week we try to find quick takeaways and frameworks to help ground us. Um, Dr. Ginsburg, Dr. Silver, Dr. Karras, do you have anything that works for you specifically? Good question. Um, I'll, I'll jump in really quickly. I, I'm a huge proponent of write it down. Um, I, I'm a whiteboard guy, so I, I will put down things I'm really wanting to work on or parental intentions I'm trying to, you know, stay focused on or workout plans that I have or anything like that. So I'm a big proponent of writing it down. Um, there's a book out there called Switch um, that's focused on uh, creating the environment for success. So take a look at your environment and, you know, around your home and figure out, am I setting myself up for success here? Um, because uh, so oftentimes we have great intention, but our environment is set up for something completely different than that. So I think that's, that's really important. And, uh, you know, have a great team around you, have folks who you really trust, who you can confide in, you can vent, whether it's a colleague or a spouse or a friend or a partner, um, you know, have a team around you and be honest with yourself and them. I don't think I could add um, to that. I think that's really, that's brilliant advice. For me, it feels as though things are so disparate for me that having one place to write is really important. And I'm not a good journaler. So the book, that, and I call it my binky, it, you know, I have it all the time. It's really nice that it, it, it's a calendar, but also there are daily um, or weekly places to, um, to reflect on. Um, and so uh, the one of them actually for this week is done is better than perfect. And then it asks you, and so there is a prompt that's there. And because I'm an academic at heart, I love, I love writing prompts. And so that's nice for me to really think about what, what, do, what does that mean and how can I use that? But then there are also, there's a, a place for goals. So for me, having a place that's actually asking me to write my goals down instead of me thinking, 
you know, remaining organized to be able to do that is, is important. And so I do love my Binky. And I do, I need a different kinds of uh, support network. And so my, my husband at home is really terrific, but I also need work friends that I can uh, be brutally, off, off, you know, brutally honest with and express my, my extreme frustrations and celebrate those, um, those even small achievements that we are, we're all experiencing. So, so right on. There again. You're mute. There you go. Yeah, Clayton. So I try to I try to keep those sports metaphors in mind. And and sports sports are not valuable unto themselves. They just are not. You know, as much as we love our Broncos, as much as we love watching athletes, what's valuable about sports is the lessons they teach us about life. And so whenever I'm struggling, I try to go back to advice coaches gave me um and they're they're all super cliche but i mean really having a great team around you every every meaningful experience in my life the most meaningful ones it's because i was part of a a team that really pulled together and supported each other and said we can do this we will we will figure this out the covid response team right now the provost office team that i'm working with the the fall logistics task force we called ourselves a team we didn't call ourselves a task force we called ourselves the, the team um, so just focusing on that support network, is, I think, is so important. Um, but also the old sports cliche that, um, you know, it's the journey, not the destination, right? And I, I struggle with living in the moment, and I struggle with being present, um, both with my family and in my job, because I'm always sort of thinking of my goals. I'm always thinking of, like, well, I have to accomplish this, and I have to do this, and I have to write this much, and I have to publish this much, and I have to get these administrative things done. And I, and I, and I do get a lot of things done, but sometimes that comes at the, uh, the cost of losing focus on the moment and losing focus on the journey. And so much of the part of the journey is the people who are around you, right? So Jennifer's part of my journey, Dill is part of my journey. And just thinking back to those moments that we had together and that experience that I had in the classroom with Dill, you know, those, the, 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 the evaluations that I get or the grades that Dill got, that's not the important part, right? The important part was the 10 weeks we got to spend together in a classroom and that she taught me things and I taught her things and we disagreed and we discussed, but we had a journey together. And that's what I think we all need to focus on again is that, that journey and not always that destination. And now I sound like a cliched sports movie. Like, <laughs> you know, I think it's helpful that you've, you've all said things that I find to be really memorable. And so um, this is what I was looking forward to is I knew there would be so many takeaways and a lot of different ones. So I hope that it has appealed uh, in the way that everyone who's here needed it to appeal. I wanna remind everyone, we have some resources on the C plus B webpage. So if you do need counseling or you want to know more about the health and, uh, and COVID resources on campus, please visit that webpage. Um, and remember that we also have counseling services on campus, which I think can be really, really helpful. Um, so thank you so much. Oh, and here we're gonna post some of them for you. So you have them there. And then I wanna also say thank you to Tremaine Fisher and to, um, to Philip for uh, helping us there on the IT side of things, to Gina for um, our captioning, which is fantastic. To the C plus B team, Chase McNamee, who's our senior project manager, um, Dill on the graduate fellow side and, and a few others behind the scenes. And then mostly um, today, I want to say thank you so much to Jennifer and Derrigan and Steven uh, for sharing your wisdom and being just real people. It just really helps. So have, every, uh, have a great rest of the week and we'll see you in two weeks um, for another C plus B webinar. Thanks.